What's up everybody, welcome to another video. Hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video, I'm gonna talk about the precise definition of a limit. So this is a topic that a lot of students struggle with when they're first learning it, including me. So hopefully I can break it down in a way that makes a little bit more sense so you can succeed in your calculus class and understand this better. So before we start this video, I will say that it's gonna help a lot. It's gonna help you understand if you have some kind of understanding of the intuitive definition of a limit, if you've seen some examples, you know, because if you don't know anything about limits, this is just gonna be really hard to learn. So I have an introduction to limits video if you wanna click right up there. If you need that introduction, you need a refresher, a review, click up there and this video you're watching now will make a lot more sense. Another thing, just a disclaimer, something I feel like I have to say, is that again, this is a confusing topic for a lot of students. So if you are struggling, it is okay to struggle, right? If this is the 10th video you watched on this topic, it is okay. I went through a very similar thing when I was first learning this and honestly, I didn't really fully understand this until I got into analysis and until I started teaching and tutoring calculus. That's when I really started to understand this. So it is okay to struggle with this and hopefully this video helps you understand a little bit better, all right? So let's look at the precise definition of the limit. The precise definition says that the limit of a function as x approaches a equals L means that given any epsilon greater than zero, and epsilon is just a real number, right? I know it's a Greek letter, don't panic, it's just a real number. So given any real number epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, again, just a real number, don't be scared, such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So when first looking at this, it just looks like Greek letters that I've never seen before and crazy inequalities that don't fully make sense. So let's see if we can make a little bit more sense of this. So the best advice I can really give for helping someone understand this is to look at these inequalities and look at the absolute values and think of the definition of absolute value. All right, so I'll give a couple of examples. The absolute value of negative five is five. The absolute value of five is five. Absolute value means what? It represents a distance. And in the case of the examples I just stated, it represents the distance from zero, right? The distance from zero to negative five is five. The distance from zero to positive five is five. That's why absolute value is always positive because it represents a distance, okay? So if we think of the absolute value as a distance, then what do these mean? Well, when we have two things in here being subtracted, what it means is the distance from x to a. So let's reread this definition and see if it makes a little bit more sense now. Given any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that if the distance from x to a is greater than zero, meaning we don't care about when x equals a, which makes sense, right? From what we know about limits, we can be undefined at a and our limit still exists. We only care about what's happening as we get closer to a. So that's why we need this greater than zero, because we don't care about when x equals a. So if the distance between x and a is greater than zero and less than delta, then the distance from f of x to l is less than epsilon. And we're gonna use this graph to make a little more sense of this idea of distance, right? Because what's another way of saying the distance from x to a is less than delta? Well, let's think about it. A delta distance from a in each direction, that's how we get this a minus delta and a plus delta. This is a delta distance from a in each direction. So if the distance between x and a is less than delta, then x has to fall somewhere in this interval other than a itself, right? We don't care about that. But x has to be somewhere in this interval, all right? And what this is saying is that if x is within this interval, then f of x, which is just the corresponding y value we get when we plug that x in, right? Then f of x is within this interval, okay? So another way of saying this, that the distance from f of x to l is less than epsilon, is that f of x is within epsilon distance of L, right? This is an epsilon distance. So our f of x is somewhere in that interval. So let me restate this one more time. Given any epsilon greater than zero, and what does epsilon represent? We said it's a real number. I think of it as a requirement for closeness, okay? So given any amount of closeness to L, we can get as close as we want is what this is saying. So given any requirement of closeness, there exists some number delta greater than zero, such that if x is within this delta distance of a, f of x is within this epsilon, right, this requirement of closeness, this epsilon distance of l. So this is for each x in this interval. And that, I was kind of confused when I first learned about this because I was like, where's the x, where's the f of x? We have l, we have epsilon, we have a, where's, right? And this is for each x in this interval. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. And this is just following what we already know about limits, kind of it ties into it. Because really what this is saying is that we can 
make our values of f of x as close as we want to L by just changing this delta. So as you can tell, as if I'm given a different epsilon, I'll need a different delta. And that's why when we start proving this stuff, when we pick our delta, what we usually get is delta equals something in terms of epsilon, like epsilon over five, right? So our delta is dependent on epsilon, right? As epsilon changes, my delta has to change. The same delta isn't gonna work, okay? So given any requirement of closeness to L, we can find a delta such that all the x's within that delta distance of A are within that requirement of closeness, right? The f of x values. So hopefully that makes a little more sense. And lastly, I'll finish talking about this definition and we will do a couple examples of very common problems you'll see in a calculus course. We'll do a couple examples. But lastly, I wanna say that you can restate the last part of this definition starting at the if part. Well, I'll start around here. So starting here, you can restate this part and say if x, and this is using kind of like an interval notation, right? If x belongs to this a minus delta, a plus delta interval, okay? And x does not equal a. Then f of x belongs to this l minus epsilon to L plus epsilon interval. And this maybe doesn't help, and if it doesn't help, then just erase this from your mind. But if this makes more sense, then this definition is the same thing as this, just written in this interval notation. And if you wanna prove it to yourself, you can take this inequality, delete the absolute values, and write a negative epsilon over here, negative epsilon less than this, this and then add L to all three sides, right? And you'll end up with, I mean, it'll, it'll prove to you that this is in fact true. So. If x is in this interval and x does not equal a, then f of x is in this, let's see, l minus epsilon to l plus epsilon interval. So this is the same thing as saying this, just stated slightly differently. And you may see this in other forms too. I write given any epsilon greater than zero. Sometimes they just say for each or for every, for all, right? And sometimes they even flip these and they say this whenever this. In fact, that's how I learned it. I think that's more confusing. I prefer the if then. So hopefully this video helps. This is a hard topic to explain. I'm really challenging myself to see if I can make a quality video explaining this. So hopefully this helps some people. Again, any questions, any comments, leave below. We're gonna do two examples right now of common problems we'll see in a calculus class. And we're even gonna use this definition to prove that a limit exists, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. All right guys, sorry, I had to do a quick location change, but we're looking at our first example here, and this is a very common kind of problem to see given in a calculus class, where you're given epsilon, and you're asked to find a delta that works for that epsilon, right? So you may be given a graph, you may just be given a limit, but you're given an epsilon, so your delta is gonna be an actual number, not something in terms of epsilon, right? So let's see what we have here. Use the given graph of f of x equals square root of x to find a delta such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus four is less than delta, then the absolute value of square root of x minus two is less than 0.4. So if we can kind of recognize what form this is, this looks like our x minus a here, right? So our a is four, and this looks like our f of x minus l here, right? So our f of x is square root of x, which is true, and our l is two. So really what we're looking at is the limit of the square root of x as x approaches four equals two, and we're given this epsilon of 0.4. So you could just be given a limit. In this case, we're given a graph. Either way, you should be able to identify these things and what exactly you're looking at. So we're trying to find a delta that works given this limit and given epsilon equals 0.4. So how can we find that? Well, we have this nice graph here, and our epsilon, again, represents this closeness to L. So our L is two, so we're within 0.4 distance of two. We wanna find a delta such that all the x values within delta distance of four, those corresponding y values are within this 1.6 to 2.4 interval. So how can we find a delta that guarantees that? Well, maybe you're thinking, can't I just find one of these values and take that distance, right? And that's true, but the only problem is that this is not a linear function, right? This is not a line, it doesn't have a constant slope. So the problem is that I feel like this distance is gonna be different than this distance. So we find both the distances, and which distance do you think we're gonna use? We're gonna use the smaller one, right? Because that smaller distance is gonna guarantee that those x values 
fall within this 1.6 to 2.4 interval. We don't need to span or cover the whole thing. We just want to fall within, right? And once I find a delta that works, any delta smaller than that will work as well. So the reason we don't want to take the bigger distance because then what happens is on one of these sides, we're overlapping, we're hanging over, and then there are X values within that delta distance that give me Y values that fall outside this 1.6 to 2.4 range, right? And we don't want that. So find this X value, find this X value, find the distance from four to both these X values and take the shorter distance, the smaller number, and use that for a delta and that will work. So we're gonna go ahead and find these X values. How do we do that? Well, we have a function, we have Y values, so we're gonna solve the function for X. So we're gonna solve these little equations. 2.4 equals the square root of X. We're gonna solve this. We can square both sides. What do we get? 2.4 squared. I have to use a calculator real quick. Let me see what this is. All right, this is 5.76. Now we're gonna do the same thing with 1.6. So we have 1.6 equals the square root of X, and I can square both sides here. And I get X equals, let's see what this is, 2.56. All right, so these are my two values. Now I need to find the distance from four to both these values. So here I have 2.56. Let's see if I can write this small enough for y'all to see. 2.56 and 5.76 here. 5.76, trying to write this to where y'all can see it and it's not super, sorry about that. All right, so I'm taking the smaller distance. So it looks like from here to here, let's see if I can do this quick maths. 1.44, this distance, 1.44. And it looks like from here to here, quick math, let's see, 1.76. So which one's smaller? 1.44. So if I pick delta equals 1.44, it will guarantee that if x is within this delta distance of four, that 1.44 distance of four, then those corresponding y values fall within that range. So this is a delta that works. Any delta smaller than this will work as well. Sometimes they use the word corresponding. They want this exact delta. Just double check with your professor and what the question is asking, that sort of thing. But that's it. So pick delta. Well, I'll put delta equals 1.44. This is a delta that works. All right, guys, last example. Now for the fun part, we get to do a little proof. And we're going to use the precise definition of a limit to show that the limit of this function as x approaches one equals two. So how do we start this proof? Well, it really helps if you have that precise definition out in front of you, unless you do have it memorized already, then that's great. But how does this definition start? It says, given any epsilon greater than zero, right? So for each epsilon greater than zero, since we have that for each part, we need to let epsilon be some arbitrary number greater than zero, right? Let epsilon greater than zero, because we need delta, there to be a delta for each epsilon greater than zero. So we can pick delta, since we only really need one delta for each epsilon. We can pick delta equal to, remember we said delta was something in terms of epsilon, right? Delta depends on epsilon. So how do we know what to pick for delta? Well, that's where the bulk of this proof comes in. The bulk of this proof ends up being scratch work, where we sort of work in reverse to find what to pick for delta. And once we find that number, it really works out and it'll only be a few lines here. But that's sort of the tricky part, is finding that delta that works, okay? And this is sort of an easier example. It's a linear function, it's continuous, right? But I figured we'd start here, that way we can get the idea these do get a lot more complicated quickly, right? So maybe I'll make another video where I do some quadratic examples, square root, that sort of thing. But for now, we're sticking with this linear function. So how do we find this delta? Well, we work in reverse, so let's think about what we want to get. We want to pick a delta, well, let me write this out first. Zero is less than, what is our a? a is one, so x minus one less than delta. We wanna pick a delta so that when we replace this delta with that delta that we pick that's in terms of epsilon, we get to, what do we wanna end up with? f of x, five x minus three, minus l is less than epsilon. So we wanna pick a delta such that when we replace this delta, with that delta we pick, which is something in terms of epsilon, we get to this. How do we do that? Well, we can start with this and we can work in reverse, right? We can start here, we can try to make this look like this, 
and then whatever we're left with, we can pick that to be our delta. If that doesn't make sense, I'll show you how it works. So first time I'm gonna do is combine this minus three minus two. So this is the same thing as five X minus five is less than epsilon, all right? Now I can factor out a five. Absolute value of five times X minus one is less than epsilon. And in fact, I can take the five all the way out and it just stays positive. It's already positive. And if it were negative, it would just become a positive when I brought it all the way out. So five times the absolute value of X minus one is less than epsilon. Now, what do you think I'm gonna do? Well, look, X minus one is there. This is kind of what I want. All I have to do is divide by five, right? So if I divide by five, I end up with the absolute value of X minus one is less than epsilon over five. So I've worked in reverse to get something that looks like my X minus A inequality here and I end up with epsilon over five. So what if I pick delta equals epsilon over five? Well, then I'll start my statement with suppose this is true, and then the proof will end up going this way. So we kind of work backwards. We do the proof backwards, and then we do it forwards, right? So it is kind of interesting. So let's see what happens. I'll, I'll prove to you that this delta works if I pick delta equals epsilon over five. So pick delta equals epsilon over five. What's the next part of the definition? Let's see. If zero is less than absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then, okay, so it's an if then, it's a conditional statement. So how do we show something like that is true? Well, we suppose that that first part, that if part is true and show that it leads to the then part to being true, right? That's the direct proof. There, there are many ways to show that, but that's what we can do here is a direct proof. So now we can suppose so let's see, suppose that zero is less than the absolute value of X minus A, which is one, right? Is less than epsilon over five. Do you see how it's gonna work out now? I'm supposing this, don't I have this down here? Couldn't I just do the opposite of what I did and end up with F of X minus L is less than epsilon, right? You see how it's gonna work now? So I'm gonna multiply everything by five. Let's see, then, zero less than five as the value of x minus one, it's less than epsilon. I can put that five back in, right? And I'll put it back in, let's see, then zero is less than absolute value of five x minus five is less than epsilon, all right? So technically we have what we want and you can even split it up further. You can write five X minus three minus two if you wanna be really convincing, okay? But it's probably not required. And do we need this greater than zero part? No, we really don't. All we need to show is that it's less than epsilon. It can be greater than zero or not, that doesn't really matter to us, but less than epsilon is what we're trying to show. So the greater than zero part, I'm not worried about, but then let's see, five X minus three, minus two is less than epsilon, hence the limit of five X minus three as X approaches one equals two. So that's pretty much the end of the proof there. So yeah, this was a little bit easier in an example, but you gotta learn to crawl before you can walk, right? And I will mention one thing, your delta for linear functions, you can always pick epsilon over the absolute value of the slope and that will always work. Your instructor probably still wants you to know how to do this, but you can use that to double check your work. That's what I usually do to double check. So that's a little cool trick. Also double check with your instructor on how formal they want this proof and just, just double check with them. Always talk with them before you just take my word for stuff and listen to me. So hopefully this video helped. Leave any comments, questions, concerns, suggestions below in the comments. Hit like, hit subscribe. Most importantly, keep flexing those brain muscles. I'll see you in the next video.